Good evening, my name is Ed Maybach. I'm the director of the Center for Climate Change Communication here at George Mason University, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to what is going to be a wonderful, intimate evening with my dear friend, Catherine Hayhoe. Um, this is also the Beck Environmental Lecture. Uh, it's the first for the 25th anniversary of the Fall for the Book Literary Festival, so there's all kinds of important things going on. Uh, the festival actually begins formally next week. You can find the full schedule uh, on the website. That's fallforthebook.org. Okay. Two quick housekeeping notes. Turn the mobile, the ringer off on your mobile phones, please. Uh, secondly, for those of you who registered to get a ticket, which should be all of you, except those of you who snuck in, um, <laughs> you will get a, an email asking you to give us feedback on the event. So we would greatly appreciate it if you would do that. Um, and now, an important note of gratitude. Uh, Lucy Beck, Bob Beck, are our uh, supporters for the lecture this evening. So I'd like you all to join me in thanking them for doing that. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Catherine Hayhoe, who has been a, a wonderful colleague, a dear, grown to be a dear friend over the past decade. Um, it's just been a great pleasure of my life to have the opportunity to have worked with her and to continue working with her. Kat, unlike me, I'm a social scientist, okay, communication scientist and public health professional. Catherine is an atmospheric scientist whose research focuses on understanding what climate change means for people and the places where they live. She's the, also the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy. Um, she also maintains her academic position at Texas Tech. She is a Horn Distinguished Professor and Endowed Professor of Public Policy and Public Law at Texas Tech University. She has been named by Time Magazine, one of their most 100 most influential people. She's been, she is currently a United Nations Champion of the Earth, and she is also the World Evangelical Alliance's Climate Ambassador. On the more fun side, <laughs> she runs a, a PBS digital series called Global Warming. If you haven't watched her videos, I would highly encourage you. Global, did I say global warming? I, I just got the feedback that I meant to say global weirding. Thank you so much. <laughs> Love a little feedback to make sure I'm doing this right. Um, and her book. Saving us a climate scientist case for hope and healing in the divided world is what brought us all here tonight. And over dinner, we, the closing moment of a, an intimate dinner of 20 people that we had, the closing thought of that dinner was the best thing about being worried about climate change is spending time with other people who are worried about climate change <laughs> and doing something about it. So with that, I give you my dear friend, Catherine. Thank you, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you here tonight. Um, as you might know, if you've ever seen me speak before, uh, I, oops, are we losing it here? Yeah, we just lost it for a second. Did I wiggle it? I wiggled it. There we go. Nope. <laughs> Not touching it. Okay. Um, I like to ask you questions as well as have you ask me questions. So this is a good opportunity for you to go ahead and take out your phone. If you have an alarm on it or the ringer on, you can go ahead and turn it off at this time. Um, but go ahead and take a picture of that with your camera. Or... And when you do that, it's gonna take you to a question. And I see a few people still getting the QR code here. Still a few people doing it. On the question, you'll see the QR code too, but it'll just be a little smaller, so you have to zoom a little bit more. So let me just wait one more second here, okay? Um, and I just had a first question for you because I just wanna know who you are. Um, no surprise, the speed at which people reply to this question tends to correlate with age, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll give it a minute because you know when I, when I click to this, the undergraduate students for 50% and you're already down at 35%. So clearly you are overrepresented in the early returns. Um, but we have graduate students, researchers, faculty, some administration, and a lot of alumni or community members. That's great. All right. Now I want to ask you another question, and this question is a harder question. 
This question I need you to answer with a word. Not two words, just one word. The reason why I only want one word is because, as you're going to see, it's a wordle. So when I say climate change, how do you feel? When you see a news article on climate change, how do you feel? When you hear somebody else talk about climate change, how do you feel? I first asked a group of mothers in Moab, Utah, this question. When I was giving my very first book talk. And I was curious, I thought, well, how do people feel about it? So I asked them, and when I asked them how they felt, if I showed you their answers, you couldn't tell the difference. And since then, I've asked climate scientists how they feel about climate change. I've asked architects how they feel. I've asked artists how they feel. I've asked healthcare professionals how they feel. I've asked Catholic nuns how they feel. And you cannot tell the difference between anyone's responses. In fact, being a scientist, I've analyzed them and there is no statistically significant difference between the responses that we get. So if you feel worried and anxious, concerned and overwhelmed, the first thing I want you to know is you are not alone. Most people feel that way. People who show up to any talk I give, whether in person or online, and I give about 100 a year, so that's a very large sample size, 90 to 95% of those people have a negative response to this question. Sometimes it's more like 97%. So you are not alone. And surveys show, depending on which survey you look at, that across the United States, between two thirds to three quarters of people in the United States feel worried. This is a study uh, from the Yale Program on Climate Communication, who of course, frequent collaborators with the George Mason Center on Climate Communication, where um, a year or two ago, they polled people around the world. And they said, are you worried about climate change? And anywhere that is red or pink is very or somewhat worried. And you can see just about all of the world is worried except for one country where people are starving to death as we speak, and so they have more immediate concerns. The second thing I want, to know, what you, want you to know, if you said you were worried or paralyzed or anxious or sad or depressed or frustrated or angry, is that what you are feeling is an entirely rational response to what's happening. And because this is a book talk, I wanted to do something a bit unusual. I'm not talking only about my book tonight, I want to talk about some other books too. I curate an Amazon list of books that I recommend, it's now over 60 books long, and on that list of Amazon books that I curate, we have multiple books specifically focused on how do we deal with our anxiety and concern over what's happening. A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety is now in its second edition. Generation Dread is a newsletter. How to Live in a Chaotic Climate, 10 Steps to Reconnect Ourselves with Our commu Communities and our, our Planet by Laura Schmidt, who runs the Good Grief Network. That one's just a new one. So there are many books out there that are specifically aimed at addressing the fact that most of us feel this way. And if we do feel this way, I as a scientist want to tell you that it is a completely rational response to what the science is telling us. When we look back in the history of our planet, as far as we can go with our paleoclimate analysis of our ice cores and our sediments, we know that we have never seen this much carbon going into the atmosphere this quickly. 55 million years ago is the closest analogy, and at that time, we estimate there was a tenth the carbon going into the atmosphere as we are putting in today, through digging up and burning coal and gas and oil. We know in the past there have been periods of change as rapid as what we are going through today, and those periods of change, you can count them on one hand, there's been five of them, and we have a word for those periods of change, and that word is extinctions. So if you are worried, paralyzed, or anxious, that is the right response to the facts that we are seeing before us today. It is not being oversensitive, it is not a syndrome, it is not 
you know, being concerned about something that doesn't matter. It is exactly how we should be feeling. Because we know that climate is changing faster than any time we humans have seen. This is from the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that came out. And we also know, again, that as far back as we can go, the more we know, the more worried we are. So here's my second set of book recommendations. There's a brand new book just coming out by Michael Mann, who spoke to you here last year. He has a new book coming out called Our Fragile Moment. And I love this book. I just finished reading it because it goes through the Earth's history. It's not about today. It's not about the future. It's about the whole of the Earth's history. And in this book, he proves the suspicion that I've always had which is the more you know about Earth's history, the worse it looks right now. So this is not a feel-good book. I know Michael speaks very strongly against doomerism, as, as do I, but his point is that far from, oh, it's a natural cycle, it's been warmer before, so there's nothing to worry about, which is denial argument number one. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. The more we know about why it's been warmer before and what happened when it did, the more worried we are. But how we experience this, you and me, where we live, is not so much in terms of an increase in the average temperature of the planet, because it can be cold or warm, it can be hot, it can be dry, it can be wet. So it's not so much through global warming, but what we, what you and I see, we're seeing global weirding. And yes, that is the name of my YouTube series. And this term was coined by Hunter Levin some time ago. It was popularized by Tom Friedman in a New York Times a column a number of years ago. But the reason why I really latched onto it was because a number of years ago, I was standing in line at church waiting to pick my son up from Sunday school. And as you probably know, I lived in West Texas for 15 years in the second most conservative city in the US. That would be Lubbock, Texas. The first is Provo, Utah. And I spoke at BYU in Provo, Utah. I addressed their whole student body just this past year. So I was standing in line to pick up my son at Sunday, at Sunday school, and they were going long. And so the man behind me said, do you mind if I ask you a question? I said, sure. I mean, it's not like we're going anywhere. And he said, do you feel like the weather has gotten weirder? And I thought about that, and I thought, yes, that's a perfect way to describe it. I said, yeah, you know, our heat wave season is longer. Our heavy rainfall events are more frequent. Our droughts are stronger. I said, yeah, I think you're right. It is getting weirder. And he said, I knew it. He said, I've lived here 30 years, and this is not normal. Something is off. And so since then, when I use this term with people, and now there's no magic word, right? There's no magic term that will convince everybody. But I feel like this really encapsulates our human experience, that wherever we live, it's as if we have a pair of weather dice. And we always have a chance of rolling a double six naturally, right? A heat wave, a flood, a storm, a drought. A wildfire. But as the world warms decade by decade, it's like it's sneaking in and taking one of these numbers and turning it into another six, and then another six, and then even a seven. And then we're like, hey, we just had five 500 year flood events in one year? Like, how does that happen? How does it happen that we're constantly breaking record after record? That's global weirding. It's loading the weather dice against us, it's making our droughts more intense. Our heat waves more dangerous. Our wildfires are burning greater area. Most of the wildfires in the continental US are the result of accidental human ignition. You plug something in the shed, it sparks, it starts a fire, it ends up burning down the neighborhood. Gender reveal fireworks, they started one of the big fires. One of the fires was started by somebody tossing a load of burning trash into the dry brush. These are not arson, they're just idiots. <laughs> About 7% is arson. Up in Canada and Alaska, it's mostly lightning. Now, there's not a strong correlation between people doing stupid things with fire and climate change. Now, there might be a small correlation because as we know, thanks to the health research that many do, including right here at George Mason, we know that higher temperatures and higher CO2 levels do affect our brain function. But leaving that aside, maybe that'll be a future lecture, there's not necessarily a change in the number of people doing stupid things, but here's the difference. Imagine if you dumped a load of burning trash into green, wet wood. What would happen? Not much. Then imagine if you dump it into a pile of bone-dry kindling that's been baking in 100 degrees without a drop of rain for weeks. A bonfire. 
That's how climate change is affecting it. Now, with hurricanes, we aren't seeing more frequent hurricanes. We're not. And we didn't expect to either, because the mechanisms that cause hurricanes to form, as the world gets warmer, some of them are moving in this direction, some of them are moving in this direction. The net result is not much change. But what we are seeing is those hurricanes are getting stronger, and they're ratcheting up overnight from tropical storms into category three, four, or even five storms, and they're dumping huge amounts of rainfall on us. Why? Because hurricanes get their energy from warm ocean water. And all of this heat trapping gases that we're producing that are building up in the atmosphere, wrapping an extra blanket around the planet, trapping all that extra heat, 89% of the extra heat's going into the ocean. 1% is going into the atmosphere. The rest is going into melting ice and into the land surface. So this is how climate change is loading the dice against us. And this is affecting us right here. What is happening right here? Extreme heat sweeps across DC with serious challenges for schools and water supply. How bad is the air quality from wildfire smoke? When I was flying in here today, I looked out the window and I saw a layer of smoke over Northern Virginia. It was not the pollution over DC. It was a layer of smoke. In the last two weeks, enough area has burned in Canada to equal a typical wildfire season in the last two weeks. Those fires are still burning. Flash flooding. Sea level rise flooding the basements of museums like the Smithsonian. We were already seeing this right here where you live, and then along came 2023. It is still one for the record books. Whether we're talking about the wildfires in Greece, in the Canary Islands, in the Northwest Territories, or in Hawaii. Whether we're talking about the hot tub temperature seawater off the coast of Florida, or what's happening up in the Northern Arctic. Whether we're talking about the fact that one of my colleagues posted on LinkedIn the other day, she said, waking up today to see the first glacier we ever studied in Columbia was found dead yesterday. When we study things, we identify with them. So this is what we've seen this year. And if you follow me on Instagram, you know that I just posted one of my colleagues, Zeke Hausfather's um, posts on Instagram. He was talking about how September temperatures globally are off the charts. And he, the only way he could describe it is absolutely bananas. When scientists are running out of words, you know we have an issue, right? In the United States, back in the 1980s, there was $1 billion climate and weather disaster on average every four months. Accounting for how the value of the dollar has changed, because obviously it has, by the 2010s, there was one every 2.8 weeks, and this year so far, there's one every two weeks, and we're still counting. It's not only about understanding that it's getting worse. What we can do now, as scientists, is we can put a number on it. We can put a number on how much more rain fell during a specific hurricane because of climate change, we can put a number on how much money was lost because of humans making that hurricane worse. And a study that came out just this past May, they can even name the companies that are responsible for the acres of forest burned in the Western United States. This is a field of research called attribution, and it is fascinating because talk about putting a human fingerprint, they can put a name on the amount of ice in the Arctic that melted because of the emissions of that company, that state, or that country. If you're interested in knowing more about attribution, I have a phenomenal book recommendation for you. It is called Angry Weather. It is by my colleague, Freddie Otto. She is a researcher in England, and she studies how to put numbers on how much worse climate change made something. And this is her photo, but I wanted to share with you the headline that went under her photo because I thought it was so interesting. The pleasantly terrifying Dr. Freddie Otto. <laughs> so again, if you are terrified, it is a rational response to the research that scientists like Freddie are doing. Why does this matter to us? Because it affects us, it affects the water we drink, literally. It is affecting the air that we breathe. It is affecting the food that we eat, the quantity and the quality of our food. It is affecting the buildings and roads and systems that we use that were built for a planet that no longer exists. The nature that surrounds us is also being affected in ways that we can see. If, we, if you've lived here for a while, if you're familiar with the nature that surrounds this area, you have seen the changes. 
If you want to know how those changes are affecting us, my goodness, I limited myself to just three books. The Heat Will Kill You First, just came out by Jeff Goodall, very cheery title. Yeah. Jeff and I are doing an event together at the end of the month. The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming, such a depressing book that I actually have a section in my book called The Uninhabitable Earth Syndrome. The climate book that Greta edited has over a hundred of us, I wrote the heat chapter, talking about all the different ways that climate change are affecting us. If you want like a, you know, five, three pages on each way it's affecting us, pick that up. There's no question that climate change is affecting every aspect of our lives. Climate change is affecting your sleep patterns. Climate change is affecting obesity in children. Climate change is affecting the nutritional content of our food. Climate change is affecting things that we had no image or picture of 10 or 20 years ago. Climate change is, as the US military calls it, a threat multiplier. It's the hole in the bucket. If we don't fix it, it's going to fix us. But the bottom line here is a really important one. It is not about saving the planet. For so long, we've heard this, this um, dialogue that, you know, it's people or the planet. It's the environment or the economy. Well, where does the air we breathe come from? The food we eat, the materials we use. Where does everything we have come from? It comes from the planet. The planet will be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. The planet doesn't need us. We need the planet. We cannot float around in outer space without the resources this planet provides. And so when we shift that focus, all of a sudden the imaginary conflict between, well, I'd like to do this for the environment, but really I don't have the time or I don't have the money or I don't have the resources, that argument just evaporates. It's not about us or the planet, it's about either both of us or none. I was able to sit right in the front row at one of Stephen Hawking's last talks. Stephen Hawking, famous scientist, famous cos uh, cosmologist, well known in his later years for speaking about the urgency of climate action and the risk of the climate crisis. So in his talk, he spoke very eloquently through the, the means of the machine that translated his thoughts into, into speech about the risks of climate change. And I was nodding along in the front row. And then all of a sudden, you know how they do that sound where the record grinds to a halt? All of a sudden he said something and the record of my brain just ground to a halt. And he said, and that's why we have to terraform Mars. I was like, what? First of all, do you think you're gonna get any representative part of Earth's population to Mars before climate change overwhelms our civilization? No. And why I care about climate change is because it's so unfair. The poorest and most marginalized are the most affected. Who's going to be left behind? We've seen those movies. We know exactly who's going to be left behind, right? There's literally movies about that. And then what happens if you terraform Mars and you take the same attitudes, the same problems with you, the same thing happens. And then think about the effort involved in terraforming an entire planet compared to just fixing what we've done here. So, I was very concerned about this and I was speaking the next day. So I went backstage the next day to get ready and Lord Martin Rees was the other speaker in my session and he's the Royal Astronomer of England and he is actually from the same college, Trinity College at Cambridge as Stephen Hawking. So while they were putting pieces of tape on our computer because he had the same computer as me, and actually it would have been really fun if they'd switched it by accident, but they were giving, you know, him, he had an orange piece of tape and I had a pink piece of tape. While they were doing that, I said, do you mind if I ask you a question? And he said, sure. And I don't do accents, so I'm not doing the British accent. I'm just giving you what he said without the accent. But he had a wonderful accent. And he said, I said, do you agree with what Hawking said yesterday that we have to terraform Mars to escape climate change? And he said, oh, he said, Stephen and I are old friends. We've known each other for years. And of course not. <laughs> he said, fixing climate change is a dawdle in the park compared to terraforming Mars. It really is about saving us. It's not about saving the earth. It is about us, and I want to be very clear who I mean by us. I mean living things. I mean us, I mean the animals, I mean the plants. All of us who depend on each other, we have to save. So that's where the title of my book came from. And when I first wrote the book, they gave me some mock-ups of the cover, and guess what was on the cover? 
icebergs and polar bears. <laughs> and I said, no, <laughs> I didn't write this book for polar bears. <laughs> if they were the dominant population on Earth controlling fossil fuel consumption, I would have, but they're not. And so we thought about it and someone else, not me, in our brainstorming session came up with the idea of, well, what if we call it saving us? And I thought to myself, well, slightly sacrilegious, but that's really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about saving us. So that's where this came from. And that's where the cheerful sunrise of hope comes from, is the fact that if the problem is created by us, that means the solutions are in our hands. And that means we have agency. We are not like the polar bears. We're not like the dolphins. We're not just sitting there suffering from the impacts that other species are having on us. We have the agency and the ability to act. So now I'm going to talk about my book. The reason I wrote my book is because often when I talk to people, I got the sense that we feel like this is the situation. Me and everybody I know and everybody in this room, clearly, because you filled out the survey already, we're worried. But all the other people who don't want to talk about it, they're not worried. So if we have this huge group of not worried people, what do we have to do? We have to scare the pants off them. <laughs> And that is what media around the world, and I would venture to say 90% of our climate conversations have been doing very successfully for the past 20 years. Very successfully, because now there's a lot of people who the pants have been scared off. We think if they just knew the facts about it, and this is a little cartoon from my Global Weirding series, if they just knew the facts, they'd change their minds, right? So climate changes and we're worried, what do we do? We load up our wheelbarrow of accurate, verifiable, peer-reviewed, scientific, scary facts, and we dump it on people. And then what do we expect to happen? We expect everybody to jump out of their seats and run out of wherever we're having the conversation and immediately become 100% activated, right? But that isn't what happens. People reject it even more. Inaction results. Why is it? Well, a couple of years ago, I read a book and I should have a picture of the cover of the book here, but I'll tell you because I'm recommending another book here. It's a book called the, um, oh shoot. <laughs> the something mind that begins with an I. Influential mind, that's it. The influential mind. And it's by Tally Sherratt, who is a neuroscientist. And the book is not about climate change at all. It's about how our mind works from the perspective of neuroscience. But as I went, got, went reading through this book, I still remember I had a highlighter. I always highlight when I read. I had a highlighter, and it was the orange of the first circle up there. And after I'd gone through about three or four chapters, I realized that there was more orange than there was like paper. Because everything she said was so applicable to the climate crisis. And when she said this, I felt like a giant light bulb went on in my head. She said, fear and anxiety. And again, she's not talking about climate change. She's just talking about our brain. Fear and anxiety cause us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than take action. Huge light bulb. So what are we doing? We are freezing people and making them anxious, mission accomplished. Big green check on that one, we did it. But we're stuck in this cycle where climate just changes more. So how do we untangle this? It begins by looking at the data. It begins by looking at the data that Ed and his colleagues have been collecting and meticulously analyzing for well over a decade now. And when we look at that data, we see that this picture is not accurate. This is not the way the world is. This is the way the world is. And I'm talking about Virginia, I'm talking about America, and I'm talking about the world. The biggest group of people now are worried. When, when they do surveys looking at Ireland or India, they don't even have the six Americas of global warming. They only got like three categories and the biggest is alarmed and concerned. Most people are worried. A small group are not worried, but I would actually argue that most climate denial comes from a place of fear. They just aren't willing to admit it. And then activated, less than 10% are activated. And as Ed just told me today, that number hasn't changed over 10 years. Now, do we want the whole world to be worried and paralyzed? Or do we want the whole world to be activated? I hope everybody knows the answer to that one, right? <laughs> you got me a little worried there. The answer is B, in case you're wondering. Because we could be all worried, but if we're not doing anything, nothing will happen. And frankly, it's better, if, you, if nothing's gonna happen, it's better not to be worried. 
eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die, as it says in Ecclesiastes, I would much rather be living like that if I thought there was nothing I could do. So when we realize that this is a problem, we realize there's something else going on here because worried is plenty big. We need to move the blue to the green. And clearly more scary data isn't going to move people from the blue to the green who aren't already there. That's the key. So what are the barriers if it's not understanding that it's bad? There's a lot of barriers, but many of them boil down to these two key concepts. And if we could focus on these two key concepts, the greater part of that blue circle could be activated, I believe. And in fact, I think there's a lot of data points showing that it is happening. We don't understand why it matters to me. We haven't connected our head to our heart. All up in the head here, all the data, the facts, the IPCC reports, the icebergs, the polar bears, even the heat waves and the wildfires all up here, but we need to connect it to here. My life, my home, my family, the people, the places, the things I love. What's the second piece? We have to connect this, the heart, to the hands. What can I do to fix it? And so this summer, when the wildfires were burning down the Northwest Territories in Maui, when, you know, just this past week, dolphins are cooking alive in 102 degree water in the Amazon, when these horrible, tragic, painful, devastating events are happening, I saw people all over social media saying, if this isn't enough, what is? But what were they doing? They were assuming that most people weren't worried. Well, guess what? Now more people are worried today than they were at the beginning of the summer. This blue circle is bigger now than it was at the beginning of the summer, but it wasn't making the green circle bigger because more devastating disasters don't help us know what to do to fix it. In fact, they actually work the other way. If Maui is burning down, what can I as an individual do to make a difference? I think nothing. So my personal sense of agency plummets as these disasters take over our news feed. So the first one has a name, it's called psychological distance. And we are very good at psychological distance because it's a defense mechanism. There's too many things in the world to worry about, and so we cope with them by pushing them off into the future. Let me give you some examples. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. This is not about guilting anybody. Do you really stand up and walk around every 30, sec or 30 minutes? <laughs> My sister gave me a watch during the pandemic. This thing beeps at me when I haven't stood up enough. Do I stand up every time? No, because I might be on Zoom. I have a watch telling me to do it, and I still don't do it enough. I do it a little bit more, but still not enough. Have you ever eaten something that you really shouldn't? <laughs> do you always get the exact recommended amounts of sleep every night? You see where I'm going with this, right? We think, oh, well, I'll catch up with that later, or you know, I'll fix it later. It only matters to those people. We do this all the time. Well, guess what? With climate change, we do it with all aspects of psychological distance. We see climate change as distant in time, distant in space, being abstract, global average temperature rather than concrete, and being irrelevant, polar bears and icebergs rather than my life. Here's the data to prove it. This is the data from surveys that George Mason and Yale and other collaborators have done for a number of years across the US asking people questions, and I've highlighted Fairfax County here. First of all, and this is data from two years ago, just FYI, I think this number would be higher today. Um, is this a real problem? Yeah, most people say yes. 72% across the US, 78% in Fairfax County. Is it going to harm plants and animals? Yes, yeah, same numbers. Where's the psychological distance here? Non-human species, sure. What about future generations? Sure, where's the distance here? in time. What about people who live over there, not here? Yeah, it'll probably harm them too. And then they ask this question, will it affect you? I know, I love that. <laughs> what? Exactly. This is my point. Will it affect you? No. Now, how could anybody say this, you think? it's because they haven't connected the head to the heart. They haven't connected these issues to the places, people, and things they love. And believe me, you might say, well, but they don't care about those things. I often hear, you know, I care because I'm a gardener, and these other people, they just don't garden, so they don't care. Well, sure, if you're a gardener, you have every reason to care, but does everybody have to be a gardener to care about climate change? No. 
Some people might care because they hunt. Some people might care because they're a parent. Some people might care because they love beach vacations. Some people might care because they play hockey and there's no outdoor rinks anymore in most places in the Northeast and Ontario where I grew up. We have to figure out how to connect what's up here to what's in here, to our hearts. And I'm convinced after having thousands, tens of thousands of conversations across the US and around the world and even in West Texas and Provo, Utah, I am convinced that just about every single person has the reason they need to care already. So what's our job? Our job is not to make them care for the same reason we do. Our job is to help them figure out what reason they already have. And it doesn't have to be our reason. That's really liberating, isn't it? You don't have to turn the person into who you are. I mean, imagine, like this is an extreme example, but imagine if you care because you're a birder. And the Audubon Society published a really evocative report a number of years ago saying, you know, the Baltimore Oriole won't be native to Baltimore anymore. You know, X percent of songbirds around the United States are being affected by climate change. So you're passionate about climate action because you're a birder. Imagine if you had to convert every person in the US and in Congress and the Senate into a birder to care about climate change, right? That seems ridiculous when you put it that way, but often we approach our climate communication in that way, assuming we have to make everybody care about it for the same reason we do. Think about it as here's climate action and here's all the doors to climate action. We just have to help people find their door. And there is a door for just about everyone. So we need to talk about this in a way that makes it clear it's now, not in the future. It's here, not over there. It's concrete, my backyard, the basement of the Smithsonian on the mall, and what I see you know, on my streets or in my classroom or in our business's supply chain, and it's relevant to me. But that's only the first half. What's the second half? It turns out that when you talk to people, I know this is going to be very shocking, just about everyone, including people you violently disagree with on all political aspects, they still want a better world. Most people still want a better life. So if we begin at the top of the pyramid, what do you want? Better, not worse. OK, let's go one level down. What does that look like? Most people would agree that looks like clean air to breathe. It looks like water coming out of the tap when you turn it on. It looks like enough food to feed your family and a safe place to live and an education for your kids and a basic healthcare system that you can depend on. Most people, when you go one level down and abundant nature surrounding them, we agree on that too. But here's the other word for this. We are experiencing a crippling lack of efficacy. The word efficacy was coined by a Stanford psychologist the year I was born, so it's been around a very long time. And if you're wondering, somebody asked me this weekend, they said, you look like you're 25. And I was like, no, you can double that. So it's been around quite a bit of time. People are willing to change if they think what they do makes a difference. And that makes sense, right? Why would you do something if you don't think it makes a difference? It's useless, pointless, waste of energy, waste of time. But today, people don't feel like anything they can do can make a difference. We live in a world with 8 billion people. We live in a world where politicians are bought and sold by corporations. We live in a world where you feel like, depending on what district you live in, your vote, your vote doesn't matter. We live in a world where there's these massive celebrities, and then you feel like nobody's listening to your voice. And so people think what we do doesn't matter. And so if you think what you do doesn't matter, what do you do? Nothing. Exactly. So how do we tackle psychological distance and build efficacy? That was the question I asked myself. And to answer this question, I went back to the data. It turns out that there is one thing that we're not doing. And that one thing is so simple and so basic and so it feels easy, but it's actually not, but we often think of it as easy, that we just skip right over it. The data shows us what it is. Now, we left off here, right? Do you think it's going to affect you personally? No. But for me, another huge light bulb went off when I looked at, and there's 35 of these maps, I looked at the second last map, and it was the darkest blue map. What do you think that map was? Do you ever not recycle, not change your light bulbs, not eat a plant-based meal, no, 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 do you ever 
talk about it. Isn't that crazy? Why does that matter? Well, talking is the window into our soul. And then let's go global, okay? I showed you this map at the beginning. Do you worry about climate change globally? Most places are red. Two years ago, they asked people the same question, and guess what? Okay, so Sweden's doing really well. Who is in Sweden? <laughs> Greta Thunberg is in Sweden. <laughs> And you can see the Greta effect is spreading. They've got activists in Germany, Luisa. They've got activists in France and Norway. And in fact, even here in the US, Ed's research has showed there's a Greta effect. When people are familiar with Greta's message, they're more likely to support and be engaged in climate action. So let me just digress for a second. Anybody who thinks a single person can't make a difference, a young teenage autistic girl has changed the color on an entire country. And the color is permeating her region. I mean, does that not blow you away? And if that's what she can do, what can the rest of us do? Because you know what, what did she have? Did she have wealth? No. Did she have fame? No, when she started, she did not. Did she have any particular abilities? She painted five words on a sign and sat outside a building. And those words were, you know, school, Friday school's quite for climate. So, by painting words on a sign and sitting outside a building, one person has changed the global climate dialogue. If that one person who understands the power of her voice could do that, what could any of the rest of us who understand the power of our voices do? Because she knew something that is so simple, yet we often forget, if you don't talk about it, why would people care? And if people don't care, why are they gonna do something about it? So she didn't even really talk at the beginning. She literally painted some words on a sign, that's it and she's changing the world. Now, talk about what? Talk about the heart and the hands. We've had lots of talk about the head. Everybody's worried. The people who aren't worried, who claim they aren't worried, it's gonna be really hard to dislodge them, and honestly, we don't need most of them. We just need the worry to be activated. So we need to talk about the heart and the head. Now, I got to this point in my presentation last year when I was talking to a group of people in Iowa. And I never give the same presentation twice. Every presentation is just sort of an amalgamation of my thoughts at the moment, plus some, some basics. And so I didn't have slides like this in my presentation. So I got to this pres part of my presentation right here, and someone stuck up their hand and they said, okay, I'm tracking with you so far, but I just really need you to tell me how do you talk about the polar bears to get people to care. For them, the gate to caring about climate action was the polar bears. Now, don't get me wrong, polar bears are a phenomenal gate. They are a very charismatic species, as they call them. They're big and they're fuzzy and they will eat you. <laughs> they are obviously dependent on sea ice for their food, which is retreating quickly. They are the canary in the coal mine. Polar Bears International is a phenomenal organization that has live tundra cams in the fall, right now, where you can see the bears getting ready to go out on the ice. I highly recommend their tundra cams. But are people gonna change the entire energy basis of our whole society for a species that they've never seen in real life? I'm Canadian and I had never seen a polar bear in real life until I went to the Arctic with Polar Bears International. So my answer to the person in Iowa was, unless there's a secret, a secret group of polar bears in Iowa that I don't know about, <laughs> you don't. When I'm in West Texas talking to Jack about, about cotton and about how he hasn't had a decent year since 2005, I talk about farming and climate change. When my colleague Joellen, an oceanographer in Arizona, when she has to wake her kids up before dawn in the summer, because that's the only time they can play outside safely, when she talks about climate change, she talks about the fact that she's a mom and she loves her kids. When we live in New York City last week, we can talk about the crazy flooding. What happened to the bus I was in? What happened to the subway, the walls shooting out, the water shooting out of the walls of the subway? What happened to the basement apartment that I live in or my friend lives in that's uninhabitable today? We can talk about what's happening to our amazing forests, what's happening to the color of the forests, the maple syrup, the species that live in it. We can talk about what's happening to our snow. My husband's from Virginia. He grew up skiing and snowboarding. Well, it's really hard. We've actually stopped doing that when we come visit his family because sometimes there's a lot and sometimes there's absolutely nothing. We talk about why we care. And so at this point, 
in my journey through figuring out effective communication, I stopped and I took an inventory of who I was. I said, okay, so I'm a scientist, so I can talk to people who care about science. Curiosity is a powerful motivator to learn new information. I'm from Canada, so I can talk to people about what's happening in Canada. I live in Texas, the most vulnerable state in the country to climate impacts, also the greatest potential for wind and solar energy. It's number one in both now. I love winter and you have to have snow and ice to enjoy the winter. I'm a mother who would do anything for a better future for my child and I'm a Christian. And I believe that if people took the Bible seriously, they'd be at the front of the line demanding climate action. And the good news is there are a lot of people who are at the front of the line, including the Pope, who just released a new encyclical today. And it is some reading. If you wanna see all the leaders in the world get a tongue thrashing from the Pope, I highly recommend the encyclical. <laughs> so I want you to go back to your phones. Remember you had your phone out and you're giving me some answers. I want you to do an inventory of yourself. If I asked you, I care about climate change because I am a, give me a word. And if you need that, that little icon there, you can see the little QR code in the corner. You can take a picture of that with your phone. I want you to give me a word. I care about climate change because I am a, and you know what? Oh, oh wow, that is the first time I've seen primatologist as the first word. Good on you, that was great. <laughs> I will say I grew up watching movies of Jane Goodall. So that's part of why I'm a scientist. I love this because here's what we're seeing. We are not seeing the same word. I don't want to see the same word. I love that human is emerging there, but I do not want to see the same word because what's my point? My point is here's climate action and how many different doors do we have into climate action? As many as there are people in the world. So your door might be because you're be because you're from California, and California is also very vulnerable to climate impacts and has huge solar energy potential. Your door might be because you do care about polar bears, and that's great. Polar bears need you. You might be a grandparent, a parent, a child. You might be a, <laughs> um, my parents love taking road trips for spring break, and we, we would typically come down to Virginia, and so I grew up with a uh, bumper sticker in the garage that said Virginia is for lovers. So I love seeing lover there. That's very Virginia to me. <laughs> you might care because you are a Christian or a Buddhist or a humanist. You might care because you're Ukrainian. And I know, thanks to my colleague Svetlana Krakowska, who's a, a Ukrainian climate scientist, I myself am a quarter Ukrainian as well. She says very powerfully that the war on Ukraine is a war powered by fossil fuels. And without a dependence on fossil fuels in the world, much of Russia's power would be gone. And so she understands that the work that she's doing as a climate scientist and that all of us are doing in climate action is work to support Ukraine in their fight against Russia. So whoever you are, I love the variety. I love that we've got dancers and librarians and scouts here. We've got people who swim, people who dive. We've got people who love nature. We've got engineers. I love all of the diversity here because you know what? Whatever you answered, whoever you are, you're the perfect person to care. Exactly who you are. Now, from now on, I'm almost done. We only have about seven or eight more minutes. From now on, you can put your questions in here at any time. I'm going to leave this open. You can put a question here at any time. And the fun part is you can upvote other people's questions. We'll get to these at the end. So from now on, any questions you have, go ahead and put them in. But I want to make this point again, to care about climate change, you don't have to be a scientist, an environmentalist, you don't have to be the Pope, you don't have to be a researcher or an activist, you just have to be a human being. And guess what? Everybody you're talking with, they're human beings too. Most of them. I know, we talk to our pets. They're off the hook when it comes to climate action, although I am looking at feeding Dr. Evil, my cat, um, insect-based pet food. I've got a lead on that, and I think that'll be great. In, yes, insect-based pet food. Um, you know, a very large dog can eat the carbon equivalent of a small car. So there, there are ways to help our pets be part of climate action too. But we have to talk about how, we have to talk about the heart, but then what else do we have to talk about? We have to talk about the hands. And when we talk about the hands, there's no silver bullet, despite the headlines you might read. There is not a single piece of technology that is a silver bullet. Why? Because our emissions come from too many different places for one thing to fix them. But, and this is the good news in my opinion, there's a lot of silver buckshot. What does that mean? It means there's lots of tiny little solutions that when you add them all up, they can fix the problem. 
So the analogy I use to explain solutions is this, and this is not a solutions talk, but this is such a useful analogy, I just wanted to bring this in. I use the image of a swimming pool, an above ground swimming pool like I grew up with in our backyard, where we had just the right amount of water in the pool that my toes just touched the ground. The pool is our atmosphere. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and actually all through human history, we had just the right amount of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere to keep us the perfect temperature for life. But at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we stuck a giant hose in the swimming pool, and we've been turning the hose up every year. The first year of the pandemic, we turned it down 7%, and then we turned it right back up again. So when it comes to climate action, what's the first thing we have to do? Turn off the hose. But our swimming pool has a drain, and that drain is nature. Nature could take up to a third of our carbon out of the atmosphere, according to the science that we've calculated, the Nature Conservancy. So if we make the drain bigger, that'll help. But there's one more thing we have to do. The level of water in the pool is so high that our toes don't touch the ground anymore, and we have to learn how to swim. All of our climate solutions fall into these three categories, turning off the hose, making the drain bigger, and learning how to swim. Which one do we need? Trick question, exactly, all. Whenever anybody asks me a question, do we need X or Y these days, my answer is yes. We can't do it with only one, we need all of them. So how do we turn off the hose? Clean energy is a big way, but it's not the first one. The first one's efficiency. We waste 67% of our energy, half of our food. Yes, replacing fossil fuels with clean energy. Yes, better land use and smarter agriculture. Yes, behavioral change. And yes, a little bit of diverting the water out of the hose into the ground, but that's the final drops we're talking about with carbon capture, not the actual hose itself. Then how do we make the drain bigger? People often say tree planting. Yes, but the first thing is protecting what we have. Did you know the number one source of deforestation in Virginia, it's cutting down trees to put up solar panels. So yeah, so at the Nature Conservancy, we've designed this tool called SiteRight. It's a map of every state, and we've got it for India too, and we've got it for Europe, that shows all the migrating bird pathways, the endangered species habitats, the valuable agricultural land, the important and unique ecosystems, the wind and solar energy potential. And then you can see on the map, if you're going to put in solar or wind, where do you want to put it? So we don't make the problem worse. Restoring the ecosystems that have been degraded, like the coastal wetlands in Virginia that protect our coasts from storm surge. Regenerating ecosystems, that's where we can plant the trees. But did you know climate smart agriculture, you can put carbon back in the ground by doing things the right way. No-till agriculture, cover crops. In Canada, the number one way to make the drain bigger in Canada right now is through agriculture. Why? Because we have so many trees. Now, after this past year, there's going to be some regrowth happening. But this is really big too. And then the silver bullet technology that you hear about, the way to capture carbon directly from the air and turn it into stone or baking soda, that's awesome technology, don't get me wrong. But I was just visiting the folks in Switzerland who created this technology, and they said that if we invested everything we had in this direct air capture technology, it would be able to take care of 5% of the hose by 2050. In contrast, nature could take care of a third of the hose by 2030. So when people say, do we need technology or nature, what's my answer? Yes. yes, thank you. But then there's the learning how to swim, and that is recognizing that everything we have was built for a planet that doesn't exist anymore. So we have to adapt our built environment. We have to use technology to help ourselves become more resilient. We have to imb embed nature in our cities for flood control, to help protect us against heat. And we have to adapt our behavior, our warning systems, our community vulnerabilities to protect people from the impacts that are already here today. There's no silver bullet, but there's a lot of silver buckshot. And here's the even better news. Do you notice this trajectory? We started down here and we're just going up and up and up. Did you know that, oh, by the way, climate solutions clean up our air and our water? Fossil fuels are responsible for millions of premature deaths from air pollution every year. Investing in nature filters our air and our water. 
In fact, it's so extreme that for the last 25 years, there was no reason for us to be using coal. If you just look at the health impacts of coal 25 years ago, put a dollar sign on them, which is almost impossible to do because how do you price a human life? If you just cost, lost labor hours and medical costs, it made sense right away to get rid of coal. So why didn't we? It's because the people making the money weren't the people bearing the brunt of the, of the impacts. When we restore coastal wetlands, they protect us from disasters. When we install green infrastructure in our cities, it protects us from disasters. Oh, and it takes up carbon too. When we grow more food in better and more healthy and more sustainable ways, it takes up carbon, but we have better food systems, more, not less affordable energy, reducing rather than growing inequalities, making our cities safer, giving us a more stable world. Oh, and it helps with climate change too. You get the picture? It doesn't matter what gate people are coming through. They might be coming through from a gateway of working on gender inequality. Well, that's OK, because educating women and girls, especially in low-income countries, is a climate solution. They might be coming through the gateway of health. Well, that's OK, because climate solutions are health solutions. They might be wanting to invest in, in more um, sustainable agriculture or even more profitable agriculture. That's OK, because ag solutions are climate solutions, too. You see what I mean? So how do we tie this together? Let's bring all of this together, the worry, the fear, the paralysis that we feel. How do we move on from it? Well, to quote someone that we've referred to before, the one thing we need more than hope is action, because once we start to act, hope is everywhere. So this efficacy, this sense that there's, there must be something we can do to make a difference, that is where our hope comes from. And when we look around the world, Countries are acting. You might not see a lot of headlines on it. I have to search for them, but countries are acting. Corporations are acting too. These are old headlines. There's a lot more corporations now. Churches, community centers, army bases are acting. Young people are certainly acting. Our own lives are changing. How we live today compared to 20 years ago, radically different. Around the world, Renewable electricity is going to make up 35% of the global market in two years. The world is changing. When we look at all the solutions, we realize the giant boulder of climate action is not sitting there with only one or two hands on it. And if I add mine, it's not going to budge an inch, the way we picture it. When we look around, we realize that giant boulder of climate action is already rolling down the hill in the right direction. It has millions of hands on it. And if I had my hand, and here's the key, if I use my voice to encourage others to add theirs, it'll go faster. That is hope. And you know what? It's science, too. This is what the science says. The IPCC literally says every action matters, every bit of warming matters, every year matters, every choice matters. And that really is the message of the sister book to mine, which you talked about last year, which is all we can say. This is part of the author team. This book is talking about the fact that we can save people. We can save places. We can't do it all. It's like we've been smoking a pack of cigarettes a day for years and there's some spots on our lungs. We're not gonna win the Olympic marathon anymore. But we don't have emphysema, we don't have lung cancer, and we're not dead. So what's the best thing to do? Stop as soon as possible, as much as possible. Add all of our hands to that giant boulder, and it is going to go faster. And we know that it will. So this is a wonderful compendium of women's voices that was followed up this year by a new compendium, which I love. is called Not Too Late, Changing the Climate Story from Despair to Possibility. This is the essence of that giant boulder rolling down the hill in the right direction. We truly can do it, but only if we understand how the head connects to the heart, connects to the hands. How do we help people do that? The first step is so obvious. It's using our voice. Sarah Peach is an environmental journalist with the Yale Program in Climate Communication. She says, talk is the fertile field in which cultural change begins. In its absence, we take it for granted, don't we? In its absence, it's impossible for a group of people to solve a problem. The goal is not to tell people about things, to lecture them, to harangue them, to harass them, or even guilt or shame them, heaven forbid. The point is to expand the number of people in the conversation, remember? Everybody's trying to get, we're trying to get everybody in here, but they can come in from any door. Talking about this, using your voice, 
Using your voice by writing, posting, sharing, by doing something where people can see you do it, like putting solar panels on your roof is actually contagious. By voting, by voting with your money, by talking about it where you work or, or study, it knocks over the first domino that leads us to that better future. So I wanna conclude with this. Climate changes, you get worried. What do you do? You load up on information on how climate change is affecting us here and now and positive constructive solutions. And then what happens? People feel empowered and guess what? That's when they act. I wanna go back to the influential mind here with Tally Sherratt and here's what she says. And remember, she's not talking about climate change, she's talking about the human brain. The human brain is built to associate forward action with a reward, not with avoiding harm. So, and I promise you, she's not talking about climate change here. She's just talking about our brains, but of course she is talking about climate change. So reframe your message so the information you provide induces hope, not dread. Isn't that crazy? Hope not dread. So when the IPCC report came out, I wrote this essay for Time magazine. And this is the picture they gave me. Scary picture, right? Fear-inducing picture. But this is what I wrote. I said, where do we find hope? We find it in action. The world has changed before, and when it did, it was not because a president, a prime minister, a CEO, or a celebrity decided it had to. Change didn't begin when the King of England woke up one day and said, oh, I should really end slavery. Or the president of the US you know, rolled over in bed and said, oh dear, to his wife, why don't we give you the vote? No, that's not the way it happened. The National Party of South Africa didn't say, oh, well, it's Friday, we should end apartheid. It began when ordinary people of no particular power, wealth, or fame decided the world could and should be different. We know a few of their names, but who were all the countless others who shared and supported and fought for their visions of a better world? They were not rich, famous, or wealthy, but they were people who had the courage of their convictions, who used their voices to advocate for the systemic societal changes needed. Those people were us. We are the people who changed the world before, and I am convinced that we're the people who can change it again. So when we know that, I feel like there's only one question left, which is, what are you waiting for? So let me ask you now, when you know that you have the ability in your hands to make a difference, when you know that every action matters, every choice matters, when you know that the world has changed before, and the way it changed was when people advocated and called for that change, my last question to you is, take out your phones again. When I say climate change, how do you feel? Ooh, I love that. So if you feel better, that's great. Are you ever gonna feel 100%? No, I never feel 100% about climate change until we fix it. I used to think I would go back to studying galaxies when we fixed climate change. Now I'll be lucky if I can open a yarn shop. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I can run one of those till I'm 95. That's my goal. So if you don't feel 100% optimistic, well, why should you? This is a daunting task in front of us. If you feel tired, believe me, I feel tired quite frequently too. But if you feel determined, energized, activated, ready, and talkative, I love that. Because that is what we need to make a difference. So thank you. Where does our hope come from? It comes from this. It comes from knowing that we can do something to make a difference. And so that's my challenge to you is to go out and have those conversations. Start those conversations with the heart, not the head, connect them to the hands. And if you want any more talking points, I should just give you this. I have a newsletter every week. And the point of the newsletter is to give you talking points. Every week I share good news. I was worried I was gonna be running out of good news. I've been doing this year and a half. I've got two or three good news stories now every week. I share some not so good news to understand how it's affecting people, places, things we love. Tennis, beer, our health. 
And then I share something we can do to make a difference every single week. And sometimes it's something tiny, really tiny, like how we dry our clothes, but talk about it. Sometimes it's really big, like how we can change society and talk about it. I go from the very tiny to the very small, but it's all focused on how you can enhance your climate shadow. What's your climate shadow? It's not your footprint. Your shadow is how you affect people around you because that's how we change the world. So now, let me go to your questions. Thank you. <laughs>